you will hear some students discussing an assignment about zoos. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, Brenda. How are you doing? Fine. I've just come over to talk about this assignment on the function of zoos. Oh, hello, Charles. Hello, Brenda. That's good. I've just been in the library looking at some stuff. I think Adrian's been on the web. Yes, I have. Well, that's great. What have you found out about zoos? I've been looking into the history both of zoos and of keeping animals generally. I didn't think we had to do that. Yes, it was one of the topics we had to research. We definitely need to cover it, even if only briefly. I think. After all, people have kept animals for recreation and pleasure for centuries. The ancient Egyptians kept collections of animals, and of course, the Romans kept animals for recreation. Ah, the Romans. That brings us to the general question of the treatment of animals and the mistreatment of them.、Uh, yes, but that's not our topic. We've been told to keep off that. Now, where were we? Our assignment is concerned with the purposes of zoos in general and in our modern era. We have to cover the history, but not in great depth. Our main focus is the scientific aspects of zoos and the work they do for conservation and so on. We mustn't forget the question of who pays for them.、Mm. Zoos are hugely expensive places to run nowadays. There are the costs of feeding the animals, obviously, and security for the animals and the public. What happens if they escaped and so on? We have to ask what benefits we get from this, Adrian. I don't think you'll find we have to do that kind of thing at all. But I've been looking into all that and the social benefits of zoos. What I mean is that's not part of this assignment. All this financial and safety stuff is not necessary. We should stick to their purposes. Now, what have you found out, Charles? Well, I discovered that the World Association of Zoos and Aquariums was very helpful on this. I've got their website address here somewhere. I found out about the scientific research that zoos do.、Uh, the other thing we should cover is the educational side of their work. The educational side is pretty obvious. I've got lots of stuff here about this, and more references to websites and information. There's also the area of entertainment. What about that?、Mm, he's got a point. I think we need to do some more research on that. Fine, but it sounds like we've covered the history and science angles pretty well. I agree. Let's leave those for now and plan some more study on the entertainment stuff. And let's do some more work on the conservation element. Now answer questions six to ten. Now answer questions six to ten. Oh yes, the Arabian oryx is a classic case. The what? The Arabian oryx. It's like a deer but white.、Mm. That is, it has a white body but brown legs and long curved horns. It normally lives in the hot desert in the Arabian Peninsula. Anyway, in the seventies, the population declined. And in 1972, the last wild oryx was shot, and it became extinct in the wild. There were a few left in zoos in the United States, where there was a captive breeding program. This was so successful that in 1982, a small population was reintroduced into the wild. Hunting of wild animals was made illegal, and there are now about 300 in Amman.、Oh. Although there was a big problem there, I believe. The population went up to about 450 in the 90s, and then illegal hunting did take place. The population crashed again, and the programs had to be restarted. But that's been successful, and there are now, I believe, as you say, several hundred in the wild. This is all available on the websites that Adrian has noted. There was a similar program in Saudi Arabia, and I think there are hundreds in the desert there now. We can use that as a definite success story. And what have you found out? Yes. What have you come up with? I'm going to the library now. Good. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute. 
to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about a printing process. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. As I've made clear in earlier lectures, many different solutions have been proposed to the basic technological problem of getting meaningful marks onto paper. In other words, several different forms of printing have developed over the years, many of which are still in use today for different purposes. This week, I'd like to discuss the rotogravure process. This is one of the most widely used printing processes, and after describing how the process works, I'll be describing some of its industrial uses and the advantages and disadvantages of this form of printing. As the name implies, rotogravure is a form of printing in which large cylindrical pieces of metal rotate, while the paper to be printed passes between them. The paper is held in place against the printing surface by the impression roller. The weight of this roller is one of the factors that affect how much ink is actually transferred to the paper. Remember that this roller does not directly transfer ink onto the paper. The side in contact with the impression roller remains blank, and it's the other side of the paper which is actually the printed side. The impression roller presses the paper against the ink-bearing roller generally known as the gravure cylinder. This roller is etched or engraved using either a laser or a diamond-tipped etching machine. This creates a large number of tiny holes in the surface of the roller which hold the ink. The depth and size of these holes determines how much ink is picked up from the ink fountain, which the whole printing assembly rests in. How much ink is picked up in turn determines the density of the image produced. As it rotates, the lower roller picks up more ink on its surface than is required, and this needs to be removed before contact with the paper. A flat edge, called the doctor blade, scrapes against the surface and removes all ink which is not in one of the holes on the surface of the lower roller. This should lead to a clean image. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now that we understand a little of the mechanics of rotogravure printing, I'd like to look at it in the wider context of the printing industry and discuss the main uses. One of the main advantages of the rotogravure process is that the amount of ink which can be transferred to the paper is high compared to other printing methods. This means that a broad density range can be produced. In other words, with rotogravure, it's possible to produce many different light and dark shades, making it particularly suitable for reproducing photographs and fine art. For shorter print runs, some other processes may give a finer image, but rotogravure is ideal for jobs that involve printing, for example, a million magazines. One common place where you'll see printed matter that has been produced by rotogravure 
is in the advertising material that is often inserted into Sunday newspapers. Of course, it's not just paper that can be printed by rotogravure. It's a very flexible process, since the rollers used can be made to any size required. Whether it's consumer packaging or large rolls of floor covering that need to be printed, rotogravure is a relatively cheap, quick method that is used in a variety of industries. This isn't to say that rotogravure is without its disadvantages. Probably the main drawback is the fact that, with large areas of colour, the dots are visible, even without using any kind of magnifying aid. Now, does anyone have any questions about the rotogravure process? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a group of students, Henry, Joe, Nancy, and Gordon, discussing changes to their work experience placement arrangements. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Look, there's the notice that Professor Jones told us he'd be putting up confirming the details of our work experience placements. But I thought that was already arranged. No, he said he'd have to check with the companies that the days we preferred were OK for them. Let's see if any have changed. Therese is not here today, but her name's first. It says the Uni Bookshop, Friday mornings starting on the 23rd of March. So nothing's changed. I'll let her know. What about Manuel? He's not here either. Is he still going to the music store in the High Street? If it's mainly music, Yes, he's still down for that on Friday afternoons, starting on the 9th. Um, the day's different. It's changed from Tuesday mornings, but that's OK. I'll tell him. He'll really enjoy listening to music all day. Now, where's my name? Henry. Here it is. I'm going to the beauty shop, and I said I preferred Thursday afternoons. Oh, good, that seems OK. And my start date hasn't changed either. Joe, what day did you opt for? I'm going to Highway Hotels on Monday mornings. Yes, that's OK. And starting on Monday the 12th of March. Oh, has that been changed? OK, I was scheduled to start the week before. I'll just make a note of that. What about me, Henry? Have I still got the Explore Travel Service on Wednesday mornings? Just a minute. Where's your name? Mm, let's see. Nancy. OK, here it is. Explore Travel on Wednesdays, yes. But afternoons and starting date is Wednesday the 14th of March. Has the date changed? No, not the date, just the time, which is fine. I'll get to sleep in. You lazy thing, Nancy. Chris's name is next on the list. Gorgeous Gowns Fashions. What a name. Yes, it sounds good, doesn't it? I'm hoping he'll bring me some free samples. So, has he still got Wednesday mornings? 
Yes, Wednesday mornings starting on the 14th of March. OK, I'll tell him when I see him tonight that his arrangements haven't changed. Gordon, what about you? I chose that software company that makes computer games. I can't remember its name, but I asked for Tuesday afternoons. Oh, oh yes, here it is. Games to go on Wednesday mornings. There's a note here saying they have their weekly staff meetings on Tuesday afternoons, so that wouldn't be much use to you. That's why they've changed it to Wednesdays, starting on the 21st of March, so you can see their working set up. OK, I'm glad they've changed it. I don't think I'd want to sit through a meeting every week. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 27 to 30. Can someone remind me what time we have to get to our placement in the afternoons? It says here, mornings start at 9am and afternoon sessions at 1pm. Oh, that's a shame. I thought Professor Jones was going to change it to 9.30am and 1.30pm. Yes, he did say that he'd try to make it later, but obviously that wasn't possible. By the way, just in case, what happens if we're ill or something and can't make it? Do we phone the college or the place we're going to? I think we have to phone the company first and then the college. Didn't you get the information sheet about work experience at our last seminar? No, I missed it because I had to go to the dentist. What else did it say? Well, we have to do a total of 24 hours altogether, so if we miss one of the arranged sessions, we have to organise another time to make up the hours. And he gave us details of the presentation we have to give about our work experience. Oh really? What do we have to do? In week 10, we each have to give a presentation to the class about the company we've been with. It's 30% of our final mark for this subject. So it's going to be a lot of work. Yes, he's expecting us to do a lot of research while we're there so that we can outline the history of the company, its management structure, number of employees, other branches, etc. And he said we should use lots of visuals such as diagrams and flowcharts during the presentation. Yes, and we should also include what we did each week the different departments of the company or positions that we observed, and tried to relate what we saw to our studies so far. He gave examples like management style, accounting systems, information technology, and so on. You were right. It sounds like lots of work. That is the end of part three. You now Part 4. Listen to the following lecture carefully and complete the sentences with no more than three words. First, you have some time to read the questions. Now, listen to the lecture. These days, we know a lot about contaminated air, contaminated water and so on. We know that smoke, chemical substances and dust particles pollute our environment. 
We're not so familiar with the concept of pollution from noise, and especially with its psychological effects. Generally, the physical effects are not surprising. Partial or complete deafness can result from excessive noises, airports, some factories, even some discos. But did you know that it's possible to kill a person with the right or wrong noise? Psychologists now believe that noise has a considerable effect on people's attitudes and behaviour. Experiments have proved that in noisy situations, even temporary ones, people behave more irritably and less cooperatively. In more permanent noisy situations, many people cannot work hard, and they suffer from severe anxiety and instability, as well as other psychological problems. However, psychologists distinguish between sound and noise. Sound is measured physically in decibels. Noise cannot be measured in the same way because it refers to the psychological effect of sound, and its level of intensity depends on the situation. Thus, for passengers at an airport who expect to hear aeroplanes taking off and landing, there may be a lot of sound, but not much noise. That is, they're not bothered by the noise. By contrast, if you're at a concert and two people behind you are whispering, you feel they're talking noisily, even if there is not much sound. You notice the noise because it affects you psychologically. Both sound and noise can have negative effects, but what is important is if the person has control over the sound. People walking down the street with stereo earphones, listening to music that they enjoy, are receiving a lot of decibels of sound. But they're probably happy hearing sounds which they control. On the other hand, people in the street without stereo earphones must tolerate a lot of noise which they have no control over. It is noise pollution that we need to control in order to help people live more happily. Listen to the following talk about man and apes, and then complete the sentences with no more than three words. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now, listen to the talk and answer questions one to six. Man has always been interested in apes because they are at the same time so like him and so unlike him. In their basic anatomy or body structure, they are very similar, and for this reason, they are both classified as primates, the highest form of animal. They also resemble each other in having hands and feet instead of claws like cats or hooves like horses. Likewise, neither has a tail. Both men and apes have large brains compared to their body size, and this helps again to distinguish them from other species of animals. But compared to the chimpanzee, for example, man's brain is four times as large. Like man, apes can use tools. For example. An ape may pick up a stick and put it in an ant's nest to make the ants come out. Similarly, apes have been known to make tools, for example, by breaking off branches to use as sticks. Man, however, is quite different. In fact, unique among animals because he can make a plan and then make a tool by following that plan. All human beings everywhere have a language, and there are thousands of different languages in the world. All these languages are equally complex, and they are very different from the cries of apes and other animals. Finally, we can use fire making to differentiate men from apes. Man has possessed the secret of making fire for thousands of years. In contrast. 
neither apes nor any other animals possess this secret. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS Listening Answer Sheet.